Hello and welcome. My name is Melissa Ho, and I am curator of 20th century art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I speak to you today from the unceded territories of the Piscataway and gratefully acknowledge the vibrant and diverse native peoples on whose homelands the Smithsonian sits and express gratitude and recognition to the people who were enslaved in constructing the historic buildings that house our institution. On behalf of the Henry Luce Foundation and our hosts at the New York Historical Society, I welcome you all to Conversations on American Art and Museums, a celebration of the Luce American Art Program's 40th anniversary. Since its founding in 1982, the American Art Program has provided support totaling $215 million to 500 museums across all 50 states. It continues to award approximately 7.5 million annually for innovative museum projects in the visual arts. Through this work, Luce seeks to advance the role of visual arts in an open and equitable society and the potential for museums to serve as public forums for art-centered conversations that celebrate creativity, explore difference, and seek common ground. With an eye towards the future and the best possible future for art museums, these conversations explore the capacity of art museums to challenge accepted histories and advance the dialogues in which we need to engage with diverse collaborators and communities. This series has been an amazing opportunity to consider issues of power and exclusion and inclusion in the world of art history and art museums. And it's my privilege uh, to be moderating today's discussion, Asian American art inside and outside the museum. Before I introduce my two colleagues, Elisa Alexander from the Cantor Art Center and Abby Chen of the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, I want to take just a moment to set the table for our conversation and to make the important point that Asian American art history exists not because of art museums. The foundational work of imagining and building this field has been accomplished by people outside of these institutions. And I'm thinking of curators and scholars like Margot Machida, Karen Higa, Carlos Villa, Mark Dean Johnson, Gordon Chan, Shipu Wan, Suzette Min, Alexandra Chan, and many others. And please forgive me for not mentioning more individuals by name, um, as well as artists and artist collectives and the family members and estates of artists and community-based organizations and culturally specific institutions like the Japanese American National Museum, the Chinese American Museum, the Win Luke Museum and others who have for many years worked to preserve historic works of Asian American art and archives, um, conduct oral history interviews and other crucial primary research and um, have presented groundbreaking exhibitions and publications dedicated to Asian American artists and makers. It's only recently that Asian American art histories have begun to take up space in more so-called mainstream art museums, or that Asian American and Asian diasporic art has begun to be taught more widely in university art history departments. Uh, none of us speaking today, in fact, had the opportunity to study Asian American art history as part of our formal education. And yet, um, as self-taught as we may be in that regard, here we are now as art museum curators operating inside influential institutions. So the question is, um, standing on the shoulders of all those I just mentioned, what are the most important things art museums can do uh, to support and advance the field? And I know there are many art museum professionals watching now. Uh, what does it mean to create space in art museums for Asian American art? What are the most important challenges, opportunities, and responsibilities that we face? And what is the future that we're working toward? Um, I'm so pleased uh, to have with me two museum curators uh, today, whom I respect so much and who I know have thought a great deal about these questions and about being ethical practitioners within our field. Elisa Pichamar and Alexander is the Robert M. and Ruth L. Halperin Associate Curator of Modern Contemporary Art at the Cantor Art Center at Stanford University. She is the founding co-director of the Asian American Art Initiative at Stanford alongside Dr. Marcy Kwan. Elisa leads the curatorial arm of the initiative, focusing on collecting, exhibitions, and museum programming. 
Her recent exhibitions include The Faces of Ruth Asawa and East of the Pacific, Making Histories of Asian American Art, both at the Cantor. Welcome, Elisa. Abby Chen is head of contemporary art and senior associate curator at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. She started there in 2019, leading the museum's groundbreaking transformation project, which has included commissioning Asian American artists, growing the museum's collection of Asian American art and establishing a new initiative, the Practice Institute. Previously, Abby was curator and artistic director at the Chinese Culture Foundation and Center of San Francisco, a community-based organization that she helped transform into an internationally recognized platform for contemporary artists. Hello, Abby. And thank you, both of you, so much for being here today. Um, I'd like to start our conversation with a question that touches on both the personal and the professional and ask about your own relationship to the category of Asian American and um, about your professional journey engaging with Asian American art. Um, and if you could uh, talk about a project or exhibition that shaped that engagement, that informed your, your practice in relation to Asian American art. Uh, Abby, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you to Henry Luce. Foundation, as well as the New York Historical Society for this opportunity. I feel deeply humbled to talk about this um, topic because uh, starting with the first question, I was clueless about Asian American uh, as an adult um, who immigrates into this country. And both personally and professionally, of course, I, I know nothing about the history. I know nothing about the art until I started working in Chinatown. So I would say Chinatown is really the first and foremost education of my Asian American study. Uh, and professionally, I would say it was really the um, re-envisioning um, American art history, uh, the Asian American art research and teaching workshop organized by Alessandra Chen and Marco Machida in the uh, New York uh, University and uh, sponsored by the National Endowment of Humanity. And it was the first time I was in this cohort uh, with many of the names that you just mentioned, Melissa, and realizing that you know, my um, my becoming of American is really my becoming of Asian American as well. It's a process and uh, it continues and I'm still learning. But in a nutshell, that was uh, my kind of professional journey. And, um, and to this day, I vividly remember many of the discussions um, that, um, that were brought forward uh, in that workshop. And I think that laid a very important foundation uh, for my scholar sort of pursuit uh, and coupled with the experience working in Chinatown community. Uh, so I think both uh, was really crucial uh, for me in terms of um, learning about this. And I did prepare uh, some uh, images um, if uh, yes, we have- Yes, can we bring up the slideshow? Yeah, if we have the you know opportunity, uh, we can see, and it's hard to believe it's, it's 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. Um, and I don't know if Laura is in the audience. Um, and I just recently, I started to realize how important archiving, you know, these moments were, um, and she was the one documenting uh, a lot of these moments. And this is just one of that. So um, it was a two week in New York and it, it had a profound impact on me both personally and professionally. And Abby, um, I, I, there are so many people who uh, have mentioned this workshop. I so wish that um, I had been involved in it because it seems like it transformed not just, it, it basically in a single swoop, fell, one fell swoop seemed to create a whole new generation of scholars and practitioners in this area. Totally. Um, and, and with many of them, I remain close friends and I always uh, go to them to seek advice from. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's foundational for me. Elisa, what about you? 
Um, well, this is a great question to start, and thank you to you both. Um, I wish we were all gathering in person, but I'm happy that this conversation that I know the three of us have had together in private now, we can have it in a more public forum. So I'm thankful to the Luce Foundation and the New York Historical Society for offering this platform. But um, similarly to what both of you said, you know, I had no training in Asian American art. I, um, you know, I grew up between Bangkok and the West Coast, uh, you know, the Western United, um, the Western coast of North America. And when we settled in Oregon in, um, you know, the 90s, where I spent my high school and college years, you know, Oregon, which some of you may know is founded as a historically founded as a white enclave of a state. So that really, the ramifications of that, you still feel it today, right? It's um, it's not a very diverse state. And so even in the ways that history is taught and who the audiences are perceived to be, you know, affects the way that you move in the world. And so maybe as an undergrad, we were taught about Noguchi or Kuniyoshi, but there was never anything broader or more inclusive in terms of a diverse uh, narrative, right? It was always just these single figures in this kind of larger whitewashed history, which it kind of reinforces this isolation that you might also feel as an individual in these spaces that, oh, there's just one of us kind of moving through these spaces. But when in fact, there have been great networks of people doing work, making art, um, but those networks and communities are not often talked about. You know, when I did my graduate work at UC Santa Barbara, um, I was in the art history department. And though there was an Asian American studies program, um, we I felt very siloed to our department in art history, which of course was a, a rather traditional um, program. And I'm deeply grateful for going through it. And I'm grateful to my mentor, Jenny Sorkin, but you know, maybe there I learned about Ruth Asawa, but nothing, um, nothing more broader and more inclusive in the ways that we see it today. And even in the ways that, you know, my beloved colleague and co-director Marcy Kwan is doing here at Stanford uh, to have that long historical reach of being able to show um, what has been here for hundreds of years. And so moving to the Bay Area, coming to Stanford, uh, has really been a revelation uh, for me, being able to stand in this place, um, work with so many people who you mentioned at the beginning of this, Melissa, uh, and see the work that they've done and learn from them, and just be within a really deep and rich Asian American community. And so, you know, when I was putting together East of the Pacific, um, I was really looking at this project that uh, Mark Johnson and Irene Poon um, and Diane Tani and Don Nakanishi did called With New Eyes uh, towards an Asian American art history in the West. And I think there's a slide for it. Um, yeah, could we go forward one? There we go. I managed to find some installation shots of this show that happened in um, 1995. And this was at the San, Franc uh, San Francisco State University Art Gallery. And um, it was really a collaborative effort at history building. Uh, it you know, featured more than 75 artists. It was the first major survey of Asian American art on the West Coast. It was works from um, you know, a hundred year period, really bringing together a lot of objects that had either never been exhibited or the artists themselves had not really shown in a kind of university or museum space. Um, and this was an effort to bring together these knowledges that existed already here in the Bay Area, but put them down um, in a catalog, a wonderful catalog that I think the next slide um, has the cover for it, if you can advance to the next, yeah. And, you know, Mark and his crew, uh, Maxine Hong Kingston and Karen Higa wrote for this catalog and um, they were really trying to establish kind of this long history that I, I'm talking about, the one that I didn't have exposure to until I really um, came here. And so I looked at this and thought, you know, this is a the curatorial method and the way that they chose to organize the show um, was very community driven, was very grassroots. And this is before 
those types of values became kind of commonplace in the museum space, things that we now acknowledge as being necessary to do good and vital changing work. Um, they were doing this, you know, uh, before, and, and this is the way that Asian American history has been written. So I really, um, you know, I've been looking to these models from the past because we are, we're doing new work, but we are also building on these kind of community driven efforts um, that I love that you brought that up at the beginning of the talk, Melissa, because it's like museums are not the first, <laughs> we're not the first places to do this work by any stretch. That's exactly right. Um, and uh, since you mentioned East of the Pacific, um, I think the next slide, I wonder if you want to take us there, Lisa, as the sort of through line from really, truly that groundbreaking 1995 um, show to this much more recent effort that you put forward at the Cantor. Yeah, I mean, the uh, you know, the amazing thing of looking at that show, um, a lot of those artworks that you see, you know, in that exhibition from these installation shots um, is now in the collection of the Cantor. And this is fascinating to me because there has been, you know, a very long period in between with new eyes and east of the Pacific. And a lot of that work still existed out in the world um, in Michael Brown's collection and museums hadn't really taken a lot of it on. And so um, working with our friend, Mark Johnson, uh, who, like I mentioned, um, co-curated that exhibition, the bulk of our historic collection now at the Cantor is from the Michael Brown collection of Asian American art that was presented in this 1995 show. And while there had been some acquisitions from his collection by LACMA and the de Young, no one had taken on, you know, the bulk of it. And so I saw that as a kind of once in a generation opportunity to be able to bring that work into the museum space. Um, because, you know, the, there are material needs for objects. And so if an object is lost, then you're also losing the narratives that are behind it. So acquisition and collection is very important in that respect. And so East of the Pacific was very deliberately and um, consciously building on a project like With New Eyes, but kind of looking at it as a survey to see where we have come, you know, what narratives have been expanded upon or not, what histories have been expanded upon or not uh, since then. And so I really self-consciously tried to acknowledge the work that, you know, Mark and Gordon Chang have done um, and other Bay Area community members have done in the, you know, the organization of this show, which includes work from the Brown Collection, but also other um, gifts from community members to the collection for towards the initiative um, and also works that we had in our collection um, already by Asian American artists of which there was very few, um, let there be, let that be clear. So um, I, you know, you're always, when you're making an exhibition, you're always in conversation with some, you know, with other projects that have come before. Um, and it was really just an argument for why something like the AAAI should be here in the Bay Area because the same folks who came to that opening of With New Eyes in 95, a lot of them came again and uh, to the East of the Pacific opening. Um, and I have learned so much already from the work that they've done. So I'm, you know, we really couldn't do this work elsewhere. Uh, doing it here is partially what makes it so significant. And, um, and it was, you know, great to hear from them exactly where they think the field has come in the last 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. I love that you bring up the additional layer of bringing things into the museum collection, you know, and that one, you know, that the afterlife is much more um, permanent and um, has all kinds of uh, impossible to imagine at the outset outcomes, I think, once something's um, physical uh, well-being is, is assured. And um, you know, temporary exhibitions, you know, we are relatively vulnerable, you know, it's, it was interesting for me to see um, the install shots to, to look for these install shots from these historic shows, because we all know as curators, they're ephemeral. 
um, what lives forever is what's in the collection and what's cared for and made available to the public, to scholars. Um, and that I see happening so much more now with, um, with art museums at, 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 in all parts of the country and in all levels of the sort of art ecosystem. And that kind of um, ongoing institutional investment, I think, seems to finally be happening. Um, Elisa, you know, since you've brought us here into the galleries at the Cantor, um, perhaps we could shift now to talk about uh, our respective institutions. You know, we're each at an art museum, but museums with really different histories and scope. Um, I'm at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, uh, a national museum focused on art of the United States. Elisa, you're at a university museum um, with what's often called an encyclopedic scope, a uh, global scope. And, and Abby, you are at the art, Asian Art Museum, uh, which was founded around a collection of Asian art. So I'd love to hear from um, each of you about how Asian American art sits within your institution. How has that evolved and um, how's it changing? Um, Abby, do you want to start? Sure. Um, and when I joined Asian Art Museum in 2019 uh, to start the first contemporary art department, um, and that was historical for the institution. And of course, I um, I was this kind of unconventional hire because uh, prior to that, I worked uh, in Chinatown in the Chinese Culture Center and Foundation for 12 years. So um, it was very clear to me that when I started in Asian Art Museum, we we're gonna build the collection for Asian American artists. And, um, and I, I guess uh, one cannot decouple from his uh, lived experiences. So working in the community, um, there, there are names that you heard all the time, but you just don't see their work in institutions. Um, and I, I even once had this very funny conversation with my mom when I was taking her on a road trip and we visited different museums. And she was asking me, where are the artists that you always work with? Oh. And, I told her, and I told her, oh, well, they, they're not in these museums. They're, they're Asian. And a lot of times they, you know, they, they are LGBTQ and uh, they're emerging, they're women. And, and then so my mom was like, oh, wouldn't that be nice if uh, we see them here? I said, yeah, that would be nice. And that was before <laughs> I joined the museum. So um, it, it, I was very determined that, you know, uh, having this kind of platform is very precious, let's not waste it. So, um, and, then, and also that we need to, within the insti institution space, we need to carve out the space for our artists to be seen in a big way. Um, seen as a norm to make them um, prominent. And that's how um, we started to working also on building the collection, knowing that the collection is gonna outlast us. So uh, I would say, let's go to the next slide so that you can see some of the work that we've been doing. Oh, oh this was, one uh, more. Yeah. Um, we'll come more. back to this. Yes. And then so in 2022, uh, we will open the Carlos Villa Words, Words in Coalition, uh, guest curated by Mark Johnson and Trisha, Trisha Lagasso Goldberg. Um, that was that was the first um, Filipino American uh, artist solo show in the country and is long overdue. Um, the museum started by acquiring Carlos Villa's work, and this is how we can have uh, this show. And the show first went to Newark uh, and then come to um, uh, San Francisco at the Asian Art Museum. And we also published the uh, catalog uh, for this exhibition. And then um, immediately, uh, actually they had a little crossover in September uh, we opened the Bernice Bing um, exhibition. And let's go to the next slide. And just like what Alisa has mentioned, this is really a once in a generation uh, opportunity for us uh, to work on Carlos Villa. And the next slide um, is Bernice Bing. 
And we were very lucky uh, to work on the acquisition process for uh, the Bernice Bing's uh, artwork. It was during COVID and um, so many things were shifting around. But uh, one thing I think the museum uh, collectively uh, were all very determined that we're gonna make the show happen. And so in September, we opened uh, Bernice Bing. And if you uh, notice the date of East of Pacific, uh, we had this really nice sort of coordination to make sure all three shows can be seen at the same time. And then they kind of overlapping with each other. Uh, Bernice Bing and Carlos Villa were also really good friends um, and, and very active in San Francisco, not just as artists per se, but they were very active in building alternative space, uh, uh, starting with alternative uh, uh, teaching uh, and, and, and really impactful pedagogy. Um, so it was important for Asian Art Museum to recognize that. And now I'm glad to say that we have the largest collection of uh, Bernice Bing's work. And, um, you know, very often um, there was this um, kind of saying in the background uh, that the uh, Asian American artist um, does not draw or uh, they don't get noticed, but uh, this is totally untrue. I remember the opening for uh, the East of Pacific. I mean, the audience was filling the the, the, the campus um, and uh, there's so many people coming in uh, to that opening. And same thing for Bernice Bing's opening. We brought the community uh, out and it was a great celebration of her work. So I would say the importance of, you know, showing um, uh, a group of, you know, the portrait of Asian American, um, their becoming and um, their footprints in this country. And it's also important that we take on different kind of um, uh, opportunities and carve out space such as for Carlos Villa and Bernie Spain that made them seen in this large scale presence. So that will be what I say that is a huge change from what uh, Asian Art Museum previously was featuring, uh, not in such a prominent way to today that they're really at the sort of like uh, the front, the frontier of the institution. Yeah, and if I can just add like, this is what it makes it so wonderful doing this type of work here in the Bay Area is that there's so many of us who are invested in this material. And so Abby and I being able to coordinate our exhibition programs um, deliberately to complement each other so that you're, you know, last fall, it was really just this plethora of Asian American programming um, throughout the region and building on the work that other people are doing because, you know, it's too much for any one institution or curator or person to do. And so the Carlos Villa show was tremendous and like monumental. And and I, you know, the, the last part of East of the Pacific actually ended with um, revisiting an important exhibition that Carlos Villa organized in 1976. And I felt like, oh, I could, I could do that. I could make that move because, you know, Trisha and Mark and Abby had done this really deep, rich investigative work into Carlos's um, career as an artist and also as a scholar and curator. But so here I could focus on his work as, you know, in East of the Pacific, I could focus on his work as a curator and as a teacher and his impact on other artists because, I, you know, there was a great alignment where you could, you know, go see um, or people had seen uh, the Carlos Villa show and so they might have been already familiar with his work. And so, you know, here you're getting a reinforcement um, of his life and history in a meaningful way. So it's not just kind of this momentary blip, right? It's like we're building on each other. And, you know, Abby and I acquired work by Bernice Bing around the same time during the pandemic. And um, I knew that people could go to the Asian Art Museum and see this amazing focused exhibition on Bernice Bing. And in that last section on Carlos Villa, we have our own Bernice Bing that was on view um, that was in great conversation with the works that were at the Asian Art Museum. So 
it's all kind of done together in this way that it's like, you know, we can build on what each other learns and opportunities to really have not superficial engagement and explore the complexities of each of these artists' careers. Cause it's, it's even, you know, too much for you, there's, you can do many iterations of a Carlos Villa show. He did so much in his life, right? You can do many iterations of a Bernice Bing show. And so if we can build on the work that we're all kind of doing in tandem, I think that that, you know, can create a tremendous impact. You go to the Asian Art Museum one weekend and then you travel down to the peninsula, you go to Stanford, you're seeing familiar artists in the same way that like, you go to SF MoMA or you go to other large modern art museums and you kind of expect to see, or you, you see certain people over and over again. And that kind of does something, that reinforcement. Can we use that strategy in a certain way um, for artists um, of Asian American descent, for those who are historically excluded, um, who are much less familiar to our visitors? And that opening, that was a beautiful opening for um, Bernice Bing. There were so many of her friends and colleagues in attendance and so many people who knew her. It was really just, it was such a joyful event. Yes. And then it, it also as a strategy, very purposefully, um, we want to blow up for portraits uh, inside of the museum and inside of the gallery, because I feel like the museum does play an important role in terms of shaping the culture. And if we want the culture of um, Asians' invisibility in the society to be changed and the museum itself must change. So I think that, um, uh, and, and what you just said, Alisa, about you know regionally what we're all doing our share um, to push uh, this forward uh, also echoes what Melissa Ho just mentioned, uh, like nationally, the surge of interest in Asian American. And I feel like here in the Bay Area, uh, this is really our cultural currency. Uh, this is our regional cultural capacity that no institution can do it alone. Um, and so we must do it all the time. And I feel like just like what you mentioned, that we should see them over and over again in different places, in different institutions. And, and not, not just in California. I mean, yeah. if I could just interject. You yes, know. not just in California you know. and not just in these kind of so-called, uh, you know, Asian specific institutions yes. or initiatives. They should appear you know, across region, across genre, across whatever the specialty of the institution is. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things I think that was so important about the VIA exhibition being presented at a major East Coast museum at the Newark Art Museum, which is where I saw it. Um, and I know that um, for so many audiences um, out here, and there's a sizable Filipino American um, communities on the uh, in New York, uh, but and yet, you know, his work you 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 couldn't see in multiple places um, in in many different collections, and so that exhibition was such a, a revelation. And um, so, I think um, I really appreciate what you're saying about the 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 richness and sort of the nuance and the um, synchronicity between the the programs of all the institutions in the Bay Area. But um, as the as the person speaking from the East Coast, <laughs> I'll just say how important it is that it's be woven into these narratives at all these different uh, levels and all these different geographies, and it has um, yeah. a different you know a different impact in each place. Um, I think the next slide also speaking to Abby, your comment about just like the the draw and like the sense of connection for the community. I think the next image, if we could go forward speaks to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at the Asian Art Museum, I think um, what we're really interested in is not uh, just focusing um, Asian American as a isolated initiative, but also to think about how that we can continue to follow and foster uh, the, this flux um, that between the Asian uh, artist and the Asian American artist. So for example, uh, Don Chen uh, has written extensively about Asian futurism, and that has a, also a profound impact in uh, shaping some of my uh, curatorial interest. 
um, and it was um, uh, really criticizing how um, the Asian is always only as good as the backdrop of the sci-fi movies about Asian future, about the future, uh, but the Asian uh, as a person, as a human being was never part of this narrative. So, um, and this um, prompt us to work with this artist Kon Ki, born in Malaysia, um, grew up in Hong Kong and now living in London. And uh, he's kind oh. of like the cyberpunk narrative about the future uh, was so fascinating. Um, when we opened the show, even though nobody knew who he was, uh, this is the, the line outside of the museum that trying to see his work. And, um, and I never seen these many young people and these many like um, community of color getting into uh, the Asian Art Museum, um, not just Asian. And I think this hunger for a collective alternative future uh, was shared among many people. And we all wanted to see a new sort of narrative being born. So with what we're trying to retell uh, and, and shift that dominant narrative about the American history uh, by introducing uh, the Asian American uh, narrative into the Asian Art Museum. At the same time, there's also this development across the Pacific uh, by artists like Kon Ki about how they imagine the future. And this is where we converge. And I feel like that was very important. And this is a role that Asian Art Museum could totally play, occupy and, um, uh, and continue. Um, now, I realize we skipped ahead in the slideshow. Okay. Could I ask that we go back to slide number, I think it's five. And Elisa, I want to pick up the thread of um, your institution's relationship and sort of journey with Asian American art. Oh, sure. Um, that's always in progress, right? We're always, um, we're working towards that always. Um, I think you know, I started in 2018 and Marcy and I publicly launched the program in um, January of 2021. And even since then, I think that doing work on the AAAI has fundamentally changed the nature of the canter, specifically, um, hopefully in perpetuity. Um, you're looking at um, on the right, the faces of Ruth Asawa, which was the first major acquisition towards the initiative that we made. Um, these 233 masks that she made of her community members, of um, other artists, her family members, and that she hung it on the exterior of her home for more than 35 years. Uh, and now it lives um, indefinitely in the canter in a really prominent position. And I just thought this was the perfect piece to like, that encapsulates the AAAI and what we aim to do. It's a, an inherently community-based work, which so much of her practice actually was about, but doesn't get talked about as much um, in her scholarship that tends to focus more on, you know, the her biomorphic um, abstract wire sculptures. Uh, and she's a kind of regional hero um, and, uh, you know, a, a woman, a woman artist and um, someone who was thinking beyond, you know, specific racial categories and really invested in these kind of and, and active in these larger narratives around um, 20th century American uh, modernism. And so, you know, this um, this opened in July of last year. It opened at the same time that with the arrival of our new director at the Cantor, Veronica Roberts, who has been such an amazing um, champion of the AAAI and the work that we're doing. Like prior to this, I think, you know, the Cantor is known for maybe our amazing collection of Rodin sculptures. Um, we have the largest collection of Rodin outside of Paris or our Stanford family um, history. But with, you know, this, this Asawa acquisition and all the works that were in East of the Pacific, which were all from our collection with the exception of two and the continued work that we're doing. Um, when, you know, when you mentioned this about collection building, Melissa, like, we know as curators that any person who assumes my role whenever I choose to leave, right, will have to contend with this collection. And hopefully they will be interested in it. It will attract people who want to deal with this Asian American collection that we've built um, because we have the resources here. 
Um, beyond the museum, I forgot to mention when we were talking about Bingo, the um, Stanford libraries and special collections acquired Bingo's archive. So you can pay a visit to the Asian Art Museum if you're a scholar or researcher and look at a great body of her work there. You can come down to Stanford and you can go through her papers that are just amazing. There's drawings in there too. There's her dream journals. There's letters that she wrote. There's exhibition posters. There's just, it's a great, you know, picture of also Bay Area life and the Beat Generation um, and her archives. Uh, and we have the archives of Asawa too, which is part of the reason why I acquired this work. And last year, as part of our big launch, um, Marcy worked with a huge group to publish the Martin Wong um, digital catalog Raisinate, which I don't have an image of here, but you can find it on the Stanford Library's website. And that is just like a monumental resource that took a tremendous amount of energy, but um, it's a free open source digital catalog Raisinate of Martin Wong's work. And so that represents another type of project that we're interested yes. in doing. Um, we really are invested as a university art museum and because we are connected to a larger university in thinking about ways that we can leverage our collective resources um, and also serve as a kind of research hub, which you all know because you were part of this wonderful convening that, um, that we organized last fall, IMU, UR2, Art Aesthetics and Asian America, which I still think about um, at all the time, really what happened last fall, um, this convening of, you know, 40, more than 40 Asian American artists, curators, scholars to come together over the course of two days and just um, talk about, you know, what is interesting to us, what we see as the future of the field, questions we have for each other. It was an intergenerational, transnational um, interdisciplinary group. And the keynote, of course, was with Kathy Park Hong, Jen Liu, and Marcy. And there have been things that have come out of that that I, you know, I'll mention a couple, but I'm sure more have happened and more will continue to happen. But for example, Professor Summer Kim Lee and Catalina Uyang, who um, were in conversation in the same panel, in the same panel that you were on, Melissa, they um, uh, published a conversation in MOMAS uh, based on, you know, building on their conversation that they started here. Um, media studies professor Jean Ma uh, invited Tiffany Shaw back to do a screening of a work in progress to Stanford. So she was able to come back and talk with students and screen her work. And so I just think that was, speaking of um, these kinds of histories that were really important for each of us, I hoped that that convening uh, was like the convening that you attended, Abby, um, you know, 10 years ago, where just this, just the force of bringing people together um, to talk about this and to build connections and, you know, create projects in the aftermath. I hope that IMU UR2 will serve as something like that um, in the future. And so, uh, the, I mean, this is part of the reason I really like being at a university art museum is being able to engage in these kind of cross campus conversations and um, work with the libraries and work with students and work with professors. Uh, that is, you know, one of the more exciting parts of being at a place like this. Well, I, I absolutely think that IMU UR2 is going to continue to bear fruit for some time. I mean, I think this conversation could also fall in that category. Um, yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and the that idea of um, planting all these seeds in collections, not just of the art objects, but also, as you mentioned, archives and also the work of, I mean, especially where you're situated, Elisa, because um, of Marcy's work in the art history department and having graduate students and undergraduates that she's uh, teaching Asian American art history to. But, you know, similarly, um, I, I'm i happy to report from where I sit at the Smithsonian that there's, there is a growing number of scholars, um, pre-doctoral and post-doctoral coming to the Smithsonian to do work on Asian American topics. When I started at the Smithsonian in 2011, um, it, it was it, it was not a presence. I mean, um, Sam has some really uh, unique holdings, including uh, a uniquely strong holdings of Nanjun Pak and his um, his studio archives. 
Uh, and so there was always a certain amount of scholarly activity around uh, that individual. Um, and we also have very interesting, and we're very lucky to have holdings that go back to the 20s and 30s. Um, some of that work related to the Federal Art Project. Uh, and we do have a growing track record in exhibitions focused on Asian American um, perspectives and uh, artistic accomplishment. But I would still say that we're at that beginning planting seeds uh, stage, you know, of more making more of a concerted and deliberate effort to shape and build and grow and diversify the collection and bring greater nuance to it. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to highlight also the importance of the collaboration across Smithsonian units for the work that we're able to do within the American art space. So in particular, the Smithsonian Asian Pacific yeah. American Center or APAC um, has been absolutely an instrumental partner. Um, you know, we organized a curatorial workshop together. We have a collecting partnership. Um, and they have sponsored pre-doctoral fellowships, so that's brought more um, people to the museum working on Asian American art. Um, and, you know, most um, uh, recently and uh, immediately um, impactful for me personally as a curator, they provided the support for us to hire our first dedicated curatorial assistant for Asian American art. Yeah. And so um, with that person, Anna Lee, uh, it's wonderful. We're finally able to do the kind of survey of the collection and the basic research to, to understand um, the holdings we already have, you know, in, in addition to, to, to growing and um, plotting yeah. out a future. But even just to understand what we have, um, it, it, it's not necessarily glamorous work, but to get everything photographed on the website with correct um, information, to have more artist bios appear, uh, those are also little seeds that I think, you know, I know that there are so many um, students and teachers um, at all different levels, primary, secondary, and beyond, who come to our website as, as a resource. And so um, that's a big, that's a really important part of what we're, what we're doing and is part of this slow um, growth and transformation. Um, I think that's so important. And, you know, I think for those who aren't in the museum space don't realize that, like, it's actually not so easy to do that kind of broad collection survey on what you have and identify works that, um, you know, could be classified or thought of as Asian American, right? Like, it's not just like you just like type it in the database and everything will show up. It's actually really difficult and so, and so time consuming. And so just doing that kind of unglamorous work, as you said, um, and being able to make that accessible is going to be so transformative. And, uh, it, and my my curatorial assistant for the initiative for the AAAI will start at the end of the month. And so maybe we should all <laughs> compare notes on, um, on what we're doing together, tips and tricks. That's awesome. That is so great to hear. So great to hear. Nobody can do this work alone. No institution can do this alone. It's just a big amount of work. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'd like to shift a bit and ask your thoughts about what's happening outside of museums. We've been dwelling with inside museums for a little bit here. Um, so, and by extension, you know, what are your thoughts on how museums um, can engage with and collaborate with uh, communities and artists? And, and either of you, um, who would like to start? Abby, why don't you give it give it a go? <laughs> <laughs> well, having worked in the community for a long time, um, now that working in a museum environment, I actually find it really, really hard um, to uh, to mobilize an institution and um, um, to actually learn the community way. Uh, and, but that is what I've been really trying to do, and that's how we founded the uh, Practice Institute within um, the Asian Art Museum. Um, so this was based on the fellowship model or artist in residency model that many institutions has. But um, the, the institute really focused on practice 
So it's not necessarily outcome driven, but it's really about changing museum practices and how could, how we could make it more community friendly, uh, how we can make it more artist friendly. And I feel like, you know, community are really the living fossil. As I said at very earlier in this conversation, I learned about Asian American uh, life or Asian American history and art from Chinatown. And um, those are really the living fossil that holds all the old and new knowledge, the latest development in a society. And I feel like the museum itself is almost like a fortress that um, it, it's very hard to penetrate. And it, it's not easily um, just say that, oh, outreach to the community. Uh, very often is this one time. And it doesn't, it cannot be done in the continuous and sustainable sort of uh, fashion. So hopefully uh, by making these tweaks and changing, you know, certain kind of museum practice that we could start to see some of the parts shifting. So that's kind of one of the things I'm hoping to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can jump in and say, you know, Yes, I, I feel everything that Abby is saying. And um, and I, you know, the organization that you used to work at, Abby, the Chinese Culture Center, I think is a really amazing organization that does wonderful work with artists and residence programs and youth artists and residence programs. And they feature work by artists who are not all necessarily of Chinese descent either. They're really on the cutting edge of looking at who's in the community, um, working in contemporary art and you know, they do things that we just don't seem to to do as much inside of museums. You know, one thing um, I would love to see more of because, you know, collection building isn't necessarily um, feasible for every institution or every museum when it comes to Asian American art, um, is that there are living artists out there and we should find ways to support them. And, um, you know, there we can make our collections accessible um, for their projects. I love really thoughtful artist interventions into your into collections. Um, they are looking at it in ways that are different than a curator or an art historian will look at it. They are pulling out different threads and different narratives. And you know, you can invite um, historically underrepresented artists, Asian American artists, for example, to look at your collections, not even necessarily of Asian American art but um, of what holdings you have and, you know, ask them to think through how they want, would tell certain narratives and how, and who, which communities would they engage with and who are they connected to, which might be very different than your own. Mm -hmm. Something I've been thinking about a lot recently um, is Asian American is a very useful term um, politically, and it was founded as a political term and it is a great, um, kind of unifying force for all of us to be able to contribute to in our own way. At the same time, um, as it often happens, there's a centralization of um, East Asia and East Asian American narratives. And so I think that um, if, you know, there, you, you have to attend to the diversity of the diaspora, not just geographically, but in terms of experiences. Um, in terms of transnationality as well. You know, I think about it because there's a student campaign here at Stanford called the 22%, and that refers to the 22% of the student population that identifies as being of Asian descent, but they, you know, um, fiercely called for disaggregating the data because um, when you actually looked at the data, Southeast Asian students or Hmong students or Khmer students, we're still vastly underrepresented at a place like Stanford. And so, um, you know, thinking about the ways that using these terms or these large overarching frameworks can be at once useful, but also that they can still function as exclusionary measures if you're kind of not careful. And so um, those are just a couple of things that have been on my mind as, uh, 
as we've been going through this work. And, and finally, I'll just say um, there's a lot of communities and organizations out there who are really on the front lines doing amazing work that museums are just not doing, and it's just not kind of feasible. So if we can think about interesting ways of resource, um, resource sharing, uh, or working with the artists that they work with, you know, there's places like the Asian American Arts Alliance um, in New York City that has a great artists in residence program. And then there are even kind of smaller, more informal, informal groups like the AA, um, P, the AAPI uh, Arts Network that's in LA, that's just kind of a gathering of artists and curators and scholars, and they get together and they go do things. And, you know, I just think there's so much value in institutions doing the work, but also so much value in those outside of institutions doing the work too, because it's so important to also be on the outside of this, right? Um, so that we can both work together and apart. Thanks, Elisa. Oh, Abby, were you going to jump I just, in? I, echoing her, yeah, yeah, definitely. The totalizing effect that you were just flagging about um, the umbrella term Asian American, uh, I, I uh, definitely, once we dug into the numbers in terms of, I'm uh, not thinking of a student body in this case, but the works of art in our collection, it was incredibly sobering to sort of- yeah. I mean, it's the same here. Yeah. look at um, what what does that really mean and um, how many artists are we actually talking about and uh, you know inevitably the the vast majority were East Asian American um, so we have a lot a lot of work to do there um, so we spoke um, we're nearing the end of our program we spoke earlier about the importance of museums collecting Asian American art. Uh, and with that in mind, I had asked each of you to bring an example of a recent acquisition that you were excited to share. And in fact, you each brought two. So <laughs> maybe we should <laughs> jump ahead. Um, and if we could go to slide 11, I believe that should be Elisa's contribution here. I'll be very quick. I'm gonna do my best because I want have five minutes. Um, so I just, I picked two that show kind of the range of what we're thinking about and speaking about um, Southeast Asia and speaking about emerging artists and living artists too, how can we support them? This is a young um, Thai American artist, Nina Malloy, who, um, you know, who is just starting out in her career, but an absolutely phenomenal painter who's interested in the long history of painting, but also, um, history and migration and her own family. And this is a beautiful portrait uh, of her family members here in this kind of shrine-like condensed um, interior space. Uh, and, you know, I'm I'm Thai American too, Nina is Thai American. And um, the, the donor uh, of the work is a Thai collector, um, A. Panachet, who runs a foundation in Bangkok as well. And so, I just shared this one because it's been so personally meaningful to me because if you would have told me like that I would be able to be in an institutional space directly engaging with my own Thai history, which for so long seemed like just, you know, in terms of Asian American experience, um, you're, there's so few of us around off in many cases, right? Um, but to be able to kind of thread these narratives together in the full circle of collector, curator, and artist um, working together uh, has been particularly meaningful. Um, and then the next slide uh, represents, um, you know, the kind of other end of the historical uh, spectrum. If you could advance to the next slide, please. So we, um, also received a gift of 44 silver gelatin prints um, from the family of Benjamin Chin, who uh, was this tremendous photographer um, who was based out of San Francisco for more, most of his life and uh, took these amazing images of Chinatown from the 1940s and the 1950s. Um, and he went to the San Francisco Arts Institute, which is so sadly no longer around. And you know he was taught by folks like Ansel Adams and Edward Weston and worked you know, alongside Imogen Cunningham and Dorothea Lang and Lizette Modell. And yet, you know, how many people know of Benjamin Chin um, and his work? And so 
we have a large body of work by him now um, and his family is in the community. It's been such a gift to be able to work with them and you know preserve this history. He later moved to Paris and um, worked under Leger or studied um, with Leger and Giacometti for a period. Like just a really amazing figure that I've really enjoyed learning more about. So you know, on the one hand, historic work like this, and then somebody very emerging like Nina, um, you're having different kinds of impact in different communities um, by having that kind of broad reach. And uh, and so um, the work continues, um, we keep building. And so I'm just excited to be able to share these two and there's a lot more to come in that realm. Thanks, Elisa. Abby, if we could advance the slide for Abby. Sure. Um, so very excited that we got this work uh, by Teresa Hakun Cha. And um, again, there are a few moments that you remember when you were taught about Asian American uh, and her Dick T. I mean, that still is kind of like my Bible book. Uh, and if anybody who has not read it or heard about it, I strongly recommend. Uh, that was a piece of art you hold in hand and then it will do magical things in your head and just very lucky that we got this work and it's a gift of uh, James Melcher uh, who recently just passed away yeah. and so I um, I I want to share this work here and right now is actually on view in Asian Art Museum in our Korean uh, art department uh, gallery and then the second one would you uh, advance to the next slide um, also uh, is by um, uh, uh, artist category that Alisa just mentioned, living artist, um, um, Jennifer K. Wofford, uh, also um, uh, with a uh, Filipino heritage, uh, born, in, um, born in San Francisco. And this is the work Fire Season uh, that she made in 2021 when here in the Bay Area, we had the large wildfire. Um, and of course, it's becoming a norm nowadays um, in our world, but it just both also at the pandemic and uh, she was also going through this very tough time and it's just very personal um, and, and impactful work um, so that we got this work into our collection. Um, very, very fortunate as well. So yeah, those are the two recent ones that I would like to share. Really beautiful. Congratulations, both of you. Um, and if we could advance, I just have one image to share from the Smithsonian, Yay. which is this luminous, incredible beautiful. painting beautiful. of Hisako Hebe. Um, and this is a relatively late work. Uh, Hebe began her career in San Francisco in the 1930s, where she studied at the California School of Fine Arts. And she continued creating, um, evolving through um, the 1980s. And we were lucky to be able to acquire three works um, for three different moments of her career. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful to the family of Hisako Hibi and grateful as well to Professor Shipu Wan, who has been a key advisor to the to Sam as we work in on Asian American art. And he, in this case, provided a key introduction to the Hibi family. So um, it is just so gratifying to be able to integrate paintings like this into the larger narrative that we tell about American art in our galleries and bring them to new audiences. Um, and, I, and I will say that um, I think one of, uh, one of the most important goals we have, or you know, what, that we have at SAM in the realm of Asian American art is exactly uh, looking to recuperate and reintroduce artists like Hisako Hibi, who you know, forged these incredible careers during this period of intense ex exclusion. Um, so I'm afraid we're at the end of our time together. Uh, thank you so much, Elisa and Abby. Thank you for your um, generosity and candor and expertise. And thank you to the Luce Foundation, the New York Historical Society. Um, I want to mention that after today's program, Loose Conversations on American Art and Museums will take a summer hiatus and will return for the last two programs in September and October. So please join then. Uh, in the meantime, have a great afternoon and a great summer.